Stables stood in the eagle lonely star, a rugged manger embraced God's almighty heart. He came into a world that did not understand his only purpose was. To save the fallen soul of man beneath his father's heaven, hope was born one silent night beneath his father's heaven. Baby brought the tooth to light. A baby brought the truth to light. He came unto his own, and they were not receive but poor and sinful ones glad they heard him and believed the word of God made flesh full of truth and of grace the glory of the Father shining bright upon his face beneath Father's heaven, hope was born one 
A baby brought the truth to life. Hello, we're the Molders, and welcome to worship at First Baptist Church of Alexandria. Some of our favorite traditions are driving around and looking at Christmas lights. And also baking gingerbread cookies. And taking baby Jesus out of the manger of our nativity set, hiding him somewhere in the house, and then finding him on Christmas Day and putting him back in the manger. Christmas may look a little different this year. I know it certainly has for us, but we're doing all the traditions that we can. I hope you are as well. So whether you're worshiping in person or online this morning, Welcome to worship. We are indeed glad that you're here in the room with us and online. And just as the Molders said, this is a great time to worship the Lord. And today's a special Sunday. Pastor Don is away, but Jerry Frazier is here to preach. Jerry and his wife, Ellen, uh, recently joined our church. Ellen has been uh, on our staff for quite some time in the education ministry. And Jerry was over at Groveton Baptist on staff, and their son, Alan, plays drums for us most Sundays. It's indeed a pleasure to have you all in our family, and you're in for a treat when Jerry shares in just a few minutes. We're excited to be in God's house today. Let's stand together, and let's worship together.
Thank you for that great singing. Please be seated. We're here at Lottie Moon's grave in Crewe, Virginia on Christmas Day, something we've done for over 30 years. It's a chance to recommit ourselves to missions, to tell Lottie what our church has been doing for international missions. And uh, it's just a custom that has meant a lot to us. Uh, Lottie Moon, in many ways, is the first modern missionary in that she understood something very important. When you go to another culture, you're not trying to change that culture to becoming Western or American, but rather you want them to know Christ for themselves in their context. She gave all that she had, all that she was, to the cause of Jesus Christ. She died of starvation on her way home from China after serving for 40 years. Let's pray and ask God to bless us in our call to missions and to lead our church to do more for missions and giving. We've got a ways to go on our goal, but I believe we'll make it. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for this opportunity to touch base with the legacy of Lottie Moon once again. We thank you for her life and the memory that inspires us still. Lord, I pray that our church and other Southern Baptist churches will be faithful this Christmas in giving and that all of us will give our very best in sharing Christ with our world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We need no other hiding place Our hope is safe within your name This we know This we know You promise never to forsake What you began you will sustain This we know we know and I will call upon the Lord for he alone is strong enough to save and rise your shackles are no more for Jesus Christ has broken every chain Of the heavens and the earth, announce the fullness of your worth. This we know, this we know, and every enemy will flee as we declare your victory. This we know. And this we know, and I will call upon the Lord, for he alone is strong enough to save. Arise, your shackles are no more, for Jesus Christ has broken every chain. Jesus' name will break every stronghold. Freedom is ours when we call his name. Jesus' name above every other. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Jesus' name will break every stronghold. Freedom is ours when we call his name. In Jesus' name, above every other, all hail the power of Jesus' name. All hail the power of Jesus' name. And I We'll call upon the Lord, for he alone 
is strong enough to save. Arise, your shackles are no more. For Jesus Christ has broken every chain. And I will call upon the Lord, for he alone is strong enough to save. shackles are no more for Jesus Christ has broken every chain Jesus Christ has broken every chain those are great words thank you Johnny and you know, Chris, uh, music is such an important time of the Christmas celebration, and uh, we just appreciate uh, Roger and the music staff and the volunteers and all that have made this a special Christmas season. I want to say thank you to Pastor Don for giving me this opportunity to speak to you today. Uh, he and Audrey, of course, are taking some well-deserved rest. And welcome to all of you who are in the room today and those who are joining from home. Today, of course, is the last Sunday of 2020. Can we get an amen and a shout hallelujah? Well, a year ago, on the last Sunday of 2019, I announced my retirement from Groveton Baptist Church, where I had served 21 years as the associate pastor. When my family and I moved here in 1998, one of the first people I met as a fellow minister was Carolyn Jenkins, who was serving First Baptist as the interim youth pastor. For those of you who don't know anything about Groveton Baptist Church, it's on um, Richmond Highway just south of Krispy Kreme. Uh, it was a church plant of First Baptist Alexandria back in 1943 when many people were beginning to move into uh, Fairfax County. What began, began as a church that was filled with a lot of North Carolinian transplant has become a very ethnically and economically diverse congregation with sister uh, Spanish congregation and an Ethiopian church plant. My wife and I uh, joined First Baptist Church in June of this year after participating online for several weeks. Uh, my first ministry assignment as a recent college uh, graduate was serving with the International Mission Board as a missionary journeyman in Kobe, Japan, and it was the uh, uh, one of our attractions to First Baptist was its strong support of international missions. Well, since my retirement, I usually spend about three days a week at the Museum of the Bible in downtown Washington, D.C. I put on a costume and assume a character, and I help our guests experience the context, context of first century life in a permanent exhibit called The World of Jesus of Nazareth. Well, this morning, I want to give a shout out to the men who are in the men's Bible study group I uh, join on Sunday morning, and also shout out to my sister-in-law and brother-in-law who live in Michigan and who join us each week online, as many of you are doing today. Many of you, especially those of you who have children, remember the classic children's book, Alexander and the Terrible, Horrible, No Good, Very Bad Get Day. So how do you know when you're having a bad day? First, uh, you know you're having a bad day if your birthday cake collapses under the weight of the birthday candle. Now, especially for those of you who are teaching children at home these last few months, during a tutoring session, your child asks you what a synonym is, and you answer by saying, it's a spice. For those of you who work on Capitol Hill, like uh, Larry Myers, you see a 60 Minutes crew waiting out in the outer office. Uh, and you know you're having a bad day if your twin forgets your birthday. You know you're having a bad day if, you, if people send your wife sympathy cards on your wedding anniversary. And this is the very worst. You know you're having a really bad day when the doctor tells you you're allergic to chocolate chip cookies. If we lived in the first century, we'd know we were having a bad day if we were arrested, stripped, beaten, and thrown in jail. And that's exactly what happened to missionaries Paul and Silas. 
Turn with me, if you will, to the 16th chapter of Acts, or you can follow the uh, scripture portion on the screen as well. We're going to pick up the narrative in verse 16 of chapter 16, verse 16 of chapter 16 of Acts. But let me give you a little bit of background first. Paul and Silas had wanted to preach in an area that, of what Luke calls Asia. It's a re- an, Asia, an area that probably referred to the Aegean coastal towns of western Turkey. But the Holy Spirit had directed them not to go there. Paul had a vision and was directed to go to Macedonia in a region uh, that refers to modern-day Greece. Responding to the Holy Spirit, Paul and Silas and his team traveled into the cities of Macedonia, specifically into a city called Philippi. In Philippi, they met a woman by the name of Lydia, a businesswoman who was earnestly seeking the Lord. She was baptized and invited the missionary team into her home. So all is going very well. But let's read beginning in uh, chapter 16, verse 16. Once when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. She followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God and are telling you the way to be saved. She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so annoyed that he turned around and said to the spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. And at that moment, the spirit left her. Now, these verses describe a possessed girl that was able to understand the true nature of Paul's preaching. She was following them around saying, most high God and way of salvation. Now, all of that sounds really good to us who are a part of an American evangelical church in 2020. But this wouldn't have made any sense to the Gentiles of Philippi. The Greco-Roman world was full of saviors and deliverers. In fact, the emperor himself called himself a savior. And so this girl was a big annoyance to Paul and his companions. So Paul, reminiscent of Jesus' exorcism, commanded the spirit to come out of her. Immediately it did. That's when the trouble began. So let's pick up the narrative in verse 19. When her owners realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authority. They brought them before the magistrates and said, These men are, are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. Now, casting out a demon is one thing, but taking away someone's ability to make money is another. Sounds a lot like what's happening in 2020, isn't it? So when Paul and company messed with the owner of this little girl's ability to make money for them, their horrible, no good, very bad day began. None of the charges that were brought against them were valid, But the charges appealed to the anti-Jewish settlement sentiment and to the nationalistic Roman pride. And they had won over the magistrate. And so let's pick it up again in verse 22. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. In other words, the life of the jailers depended on securing the prisoners. So upon receiving such orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. And about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and other prisoners were listening to them. If most of us are honest, we'd say, Really? They were praying and singing hymns? Now, they didn't have a book of common prayer. They didn't have open windows. They didn't have the version devotional app. They didn't have hymnals. They didn't have words on the screens. However, they were praying and singing. 
when you think about this, this reminds us of what is recorded, what Paul said in the, to the Philippian church. I want to know Christ, yet to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. Paul and Silas had made a commitment to follow Christ. They were going to follow Christ regardless of the situations and difficulties. They were going to follow Christ even on those terrible, horrible, no good, very bad days. Now, we all have bad days. Many of us would say we've had more than our share of bad days in 2020. But these two men had been beaten physically. It's not the challenge that most of us face, but I'm sure... Most of us know what it means to be emotionally or mentally beaten up. We're reminded what Mama taught us as teenagers. Nothing good ever happens if you're out after midnight. And that's why verse 25 is so amazing to us. Around midnight, Paul and Silas were complaining about their circumstance. Of course, that's not what it says. It says around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening. Now, let's be honest. When most of us are in a spiritual or emotional slump, or when we're extremely tired, usually our natural reaction is not to pray and sing. We tend to focus on the bad day. So how do we put our terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day in perspective? How do we keep from fixating on our problems? How do we move from focusing on our problems to worship? Part of the solution is to focus on the big picture. And that's what a college, did, what, what a college student did when she wrote this email to her parents. Dear Mom and Dad, I have so much to tell you. Because of the fire in my dorm, that was set off by the student riots, I experienced temporary lung damage and I had to go to the hospital. While I was there, I fell in love with an intern, so I dropped out of school. We're going to move to Alaska where we might get married. Your loving daughter. P.S. None of this really happened, but I did flunk my chemistry class and I wanted to keep it in perspective. So what is our perspective? Now, there's always someone in a worse situation. We could play the comparison game. That might work once. But Paul and Silas demonstrated a better answer. They worship. Now, worship is like a camera. It helps us gain perspective and refocus on the big picture. Worship helps us refocus on the fact that Jesus died on the cross for our sin. It refocuses on the fact that Jesus loves me when I least deserve it and when I least expect it. It refocuses on the fact that if we are in right relationship to Christ, we can look forward to the future no matter our present circumstance. Through worship, God can restore the joy of our salvation. And worship moves us from reacting naturally to reacting supernaturally. Is it easy? Absolutely not. Nothing is more difficult than praising God when everything seems to go wrong. However, one of the purest forms of worship is praising God when we don't feel like it. Paul and Silas surely didn't feel like it. Their bodies were broken. But they chose to worship by an act of their will. They chose to worship and to rise above their circumstances. Jackie Robinson was the first African American, of course, to play Major League Baseball. He broke baseball's color barrier and he faced jeering crowds in every stadium that he went to. Players would stomp on his feet and kick, kick him. Uh, one game while playing in his home stadium in Brooklyn, he made an ear and fans began to ridicule his air. And he stood at second base, humiliated while they jeered at him. 
And then shortstop Pee Wee Reese came over and stood next to him and put his arm around his shoulder. And they stared the crowd down. The fans grew quiet, and Robinson later said that that arm around his shoulder saved his career. It took encouragement from his teammates to rise above the circumstance. Worship need not be a lonely experience. We need each other to worship together. Eric Metaxas, in his book, Seven Men and the Secret of Their Greatness, writes that it was Robinson's deep faith in Christ that challenged him to be that first player to break the color barrier. He was also challenged because the general manager, Branch Rickey, shared that same deep faith in Christ. Not only does worship refocus our circumstances, it reframes our circumstances. Viktor Frankl, who was a Holocaust survival, wrote in his book, Man's Search for Meaning, everything can be taken from a ba man but one thing, the last of human freedoms, to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances. Now, Viktor Frankl, Fra Viktor Frankl had spent time in prison we may feel like we've spent some time in prison this past year. And Pilate, Paul and Silas were definitely uh, in prison. Their bodies may have been chained, but they chose to let their spirit soar. We don't know what kind of singing voices Paul and Silas had. They may not have had the greatest of voices. They may have sung out of tune, but they sang with conviction. So I want us to read what happened because Paul and Silas chose to worship. So let's finish this, uh, this passage, and we'll pick it up in verse 26. Suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundation of the prison was shaken. At once all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, Don't harm yourself, we're all here. The jailers called for lights, rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in the house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and his entire household were baptized. The jailer bought, brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. How many of you remember where you were during the earthquake of 2011? I remember exactly where I was. I was in my office at Groveton Baptist, and I was talking to one of our young moms about starting a weekday a women's Bible study. She immediately dropped her phone and ran to check on her infant son. And I watched the bobblehead dolls uh, wobble and shake and fall on the floor in my office. When we woke up that morning, we were not prepared for an earthquake. The people who worked at the National Cathedral and who were on the uh, elevator at uh, the uh, Washington Monument were not prepared for an earthquake that day. Paul and Silas and the other prisoners were not prepared for an earthquake. And that jailer was certainly not prepared for an earthquake. But right on cue from the Lord, an earthquake shook the jail. Many times, prison guards were personally responsible for the prisoners. So that jailer was ready to take his own life if the prisoners had escaped. It had been a horrible, terrible, no good, very bad day for the jailer. But God's will broke through during a desperate situation. You see, the earthquake was not about freeing the prisoners. It was about delivering the jailer. 
God used the circumstances of that no good, very bad day to allow a jailer and his family to have their lives changed for eternity. For anyone in this room or anyone watching from their homes, God can use this no good, very bad day or this no good, very bad year to bring us into right relationship with Jesus Christ. The jailer's life had been spared. Now he wanted to know how to be saved. Perhaps the jailer had heard Paul preach. Perhaps he had heard the little girl's proclamation. Perhaps he had listening, listened to their singing and praying late into the night. The jailer was now ready to make a commitment to Christ. And so Paul's words to the jailer were simple. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. The jailer's family enters the picture. We don't know how or when. The details of the story are limited. Perhaps they lived at the jail. Perhaps they had run to check on their father and husband. Whatever the reason, the whole family came to faith in Christ. The jailer's life had been changed. Instead of beating Paul and Silas, he washed their wounds. And the jailer and his family received a washing they were baptized. The change in the jailer's behavior demonstrated his new faith in Christ. The jailer no longer treats them as prisoners. He treats Paul and Silas as brothers and brothers in Christ. Christ used Paul and Silas' pain for good. God never wants to waste any pain that we've experienced. God can use our pain, our bad days for good, for his good. February 27th, 1991, it was the height of the Desert Storm War. Ruth, Ruth Dillo received the worst news that any mom could receive. Her son, Clayton Carpenter, private first class, had stepped on a landmine. And he was dead. For the next day, next three days, she grieved uh, that loss. Uh, friends tried to console her, but her grief was deep and raw. And then after three days, she received a phone call. On the other end, a voice said, it's your son. I'm alive. Now, at first, she thought she'd been a part of a cruel joke. He began to talk more, and then she realized that it truly was her son. Her worst day turned into a day of great joy. What seemed like a hopeless situation transformed into being the greatest day of her life. She had received incorrect information. Perhaps we've been listening to incorrect and wrong information. Jesus Christ wants to take our no good, very bad day and turn them into a good day, a life-changing day. I honestly believe in the depth of our worst moments of life, we have an opportunity to experience an intimacy with God like we've never experienced before. In the worst of situation, we can experience a closeness with God. But like Paul and Silas, we must choose to allow it to happen. We're going to come to a time of invitation. I'm going to ask you to stand, and I want to lead us in a time of prayer. Let's stand together. Father, we thank you for this incredible story of Paul and Silas and by an act of their will, they chose to worship you. And Father, I know that in this room and those listening at home, there are many who have experienced some very tough days. And Father, they need a fresh touch from you. And Father, I pray that you will just open all of our lives to a fresh touch from you. Father, for any who have never taken that step of faith in Christ with you, I pray that they will take that step of faith in these days.
difficult times of whatever caused it, you can turn into your good. And we ask all of this in your name. Amen. If you have a decision that you need to make publicly today, I would invite you to share that with Pastor Wayne. And if any of you on uh, whist- listening at home would uh, I like uh, to make a decision and want to share that with one of the pastors. You can share that uh, through email to Pastor Wayne or any of the other pastors. as you are come and see come receive come and live forever life everlasting and strength for today Just as you are, come and see, come receive, come and live forever more. Thank you. Please be seated. I want to say thank you to you for uh, your dedication to be in worship and for your dedication in giving, especially during the pandemic. You know, we have offering plates at the doors as you leave in a few minutes, but many of you give online, and I just want to remind you that we still have a few more days left in 2020 for you to get offerings in uh, before the end. As long as they're postmarked by December 31, we can uh, credit that towards 2020, and I hope that you will do that. I also want to say thank you for wearing your face mask properly over your nose and mouth during the time you're here and socially distancing. It really makes a difference to everyone who comes and helps us feel very good about being a part of worship in person. Let's take a look at our opportunities of the week. Reed. Good morning, church. I hope everyone had a wonderful Christmas. Let me give you just a few announcements this morning before we leave. You've already given $93,924 towards FBCA's 210,000 Lottie Moon International Missions Offering Goal. Thank you. There's still time for you to send and equip missionaries around the world through your gifts to the Lottie Moon Offering. The FBCA Counseling Center is available to you. Our counselors Coulter Weaver and Donnelly Rooks are still seeing clients. So please reach out if you're struggling this season. Your gifts to the FBCA Benevolence Fund are cultivating relationships and providing assistance during this holiday season. So thank you for your generosity. Registration for J-Term, short-term topical Bible studies for adults, is now open. All classes will be held online beginning January 10th, so register today. The Men's Discipleship Virtual Breakfast is January 9th. So sign up online by Tuesday, January 5th. Lastly, ladies, new small group studies are starting up in January, and you can register and find more information about those on the website. That's all I have, so uh, would you pray with me? Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for giving us all that we need. Thank you for your word that is always new and always fresh. We pray your blessing on this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Reed. Thank you again for being here. Thank you, Jim.